Supremacy, we are broadcasting live from downtown Santa Ana, Local 7. Take it away, John.
Hey, good afternoon. How's it going, everybody out there? Thanks for showing up for yet another episode of Connell's Cold Supremacy. Come on up here, Doug. Come on. As you can tell, uh, today's going to be our Dixieland show. And uh, just like to take a second, I think some of you saw it out on the card. These are the Jamba Hatters. <laughs> and mostly because um, the guys over here are from the Jambalaya Jazz Band. And these two guys are from the Straw Hatters. And I'm just going to take a second to introduce everybody here for a second, if you don't mind, Doug. Oh. Great. So on trombone today, we have the one and only Mr. Joey Sellers. Yay. And on trumpet, we have Mr. Chris Ebley. And you've seen this guy before on the show. On drums, Mr. Jimmy Ford. Then a couple of guys I've been working with forever, Mr. Tom Liston on banjo, Mr. Vince Verdi on clarinet, and his brother Rob Verdi on tenor saxophone. Um, so, now that we got that out of the way, how was your week? <laughs> John, my week was great. Thank you. Uh, first of all, what an incredible group. It's just, just amazing to sit here and listen to you guys play. You know, this is the uh, pretty much the third time I think I've played Dixieland in the last 17 months. <laughs> That's a start. So, so uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today was, um, well, first of all, how was your week? What did you do? What did did you do? Uh, yeah, it was. You fun. had a couple sessions this week. I right? had a couple sessions. So uh, we do Adam's Family Two on Friday. And you uh, did. We were with Russo on Tuesday. Or oh something yeah, here. Star Trek Discovery. Yes. And then uh, we had. We were at the Bowl last night. We did the, the premiere of the orchestrated version of the Princess Bride. Oh, how yeah. fun was that? Was it cool? Yeah. Well, it was amazing. Um, this amazing person named Mark Graham took the original um, guitar score and wrote it out for orchestra. And so we played it last night at the bowl. And that was the Philharmonic? Yes. What a good time, man. I mean, well, and David Newman was conducting, and he's... So, well, that's awesome. <laughs> he's the best. He's absolutely the best in the business. Well, you yeah. had a great week. I can't complain. Yeah, no, and I wouldn't. But um, <laughs> today I wanted... And, and thanks so much for, for being down with us today. Uh, folks, please hang in there because somebody's going to be playing in a little bit here. And believe me, it's going to be just awesome. But... Um, I wanted to do like a legacy show today and um, okay. and talk about the fact that at Disneyland, since mm. all the guys up here work at Disneyland, uh, and we're still not back yet, but the importance and the relevance of having traditional jazz at the park. Um, yeah. Q, can we pull up that first thing, man? Um, as some of you will now see, um, it'll be the river shot back in... I think it was what, 60, 62, Quinn? 62, with Louis Armstrong playing on a raft at one of the Dixieland nights that, that Walt wanted to have happen. In the park. Was, in the park, yeah. Okay. And this was actually before, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, this is before New Orleans Square was open, correct? 62, because it was, New Orleans Square was what, 64 uh -huh. or 65? 67. 67. 67. All right, yeah. so I really uh -huh. think that this whole thing, Quinn, can we throw up the next one, please? And right here, you can tell that Walt was in love with uh, one of my heroes, uh, Louis Armstrong, and they're dancing together right now. But um, if we can go to the next slide too, Quinn, the, uh, the Firehouse Five, and I think everybody up here is really familiar with that, and if you're not, they were the first Dixieland band truly at, at Disneyland, and the great story about that is that all those guys were animators really? that worked at the studio, and really? they for kicks played Dixieland and Walt said hey you guys want to play on the weekends and there was they were like yeah sure so they would come down and where the straw hatters play around that area right now um, they would sit up in front of the firehouse on Main Street and that's where they got to know, be known as the firehouse five amazing so um, all of us here are trying to trying to keep that legacy going and and we hope we're back real soon um, and I hope that the uh, the company knows uh, what an important thing that Dixieland really is to Disneyland. Um, yeah, it always had. I remember going there as a kid and just being blown away. There was music on every corner. It was incredible. Yeah, I hope we're back. I really do. So, do you mind uh, if we play another one? I'd love it. All right. So, and this this one is for you, Bill. I know you're out there. One of our super fans out there, Bill Holt. Uh, he wanted to. He's been messing around with. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans? And I thought it'd be a really great tune for us to play right now for you and we're going to feature Mr. Vince Verdi right at the top. So please enjoy.
You know, one of our uh, oh, shoot. one of our new segments on the show. Man, man. <laughs> being all loosey goosey today. One of our new segments on the show is uh, afternoons with Doug. Mm. And can you set this up for us, please? Sure, I can set this up. This is part two of my visit to Rob Stewart's shop. And Rob Stewart, as I said, is a, a legend, an institution. I don't know if anyone wants to be described as that, but if anyone is, Rob is. In Southern California, he's uh, a master brass repairman. Uh, some would call him an artist. I think he spends most of his time now doing restorations of uh, historic instruments. Uh, anyway, in f part one, we went into a shop. We got to see, you know, some of the places where he replaces and his instruments tools and, and, and his whatnot, tools and how, he, and how he goes about stuff. And then he said, "Do you want to go in the house?" And I said, "Okay." And he said, "No one's been in the house." So this is like. 
the first time in the world. You know, I got to go. He let me go in there with my iPad. I photographed everything. We went into the inner sanctum, otherwise known as his office. He's got a closet full of instrument cases, and then he's got this amazing glass instrument case with the most incredible treasures. I tried to get them all, and then he narrated them as we went uh, instrument to instrument, and I'm sure the stories that he told were just the tip of the iceberg about how important these instruments are. I mean, there are instruments that come through his shop, which go right to the Smithsonian. Yeah, I mean, he's 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 beyond an artist. I mean, he's a, he's a craftsman. He's he's just unbelievable. And and an, and an historian, you know. Uh, check out his website. He's got some really important writings on there about the difference between the trumpet and the cornet. For one instance, you know, if you want to know what the difference between conical and cylindrical is, let Rob well, explain it to yeah, you. Yeah, because that's the, the ongoing. Uh, yes. Arguments still to this day. <laughs> well, but the happy thing to notice was that inside Rob's house, there was only of all the instruments he had. There, I only saw one cylindrical instrument, so it was indeed a the embodiment shop. of the conical that's, supremacy. That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, hey, everybody, let's. We, are we going to throw that up right now, Quinn? So let's let's check out Rob Stewart's inner sanctum, and uh, we'll be back right after this. first time ever anyone's been allowed in this room and you are there the conical supremacy there's the inner sanctum of rob stewart's operation rob what's going on in this room it's my office for this can, can you tell us about some of these horns and and the history and Key bugles are both American, which are rare. Those uh, are these guys. Yeah, the little ones, uh, E.G. Wright, made a nickel, and then the copper ones, uh, uh, Graves. How old are those? 18, the Graves 1840, the uh, Wright is probably 1850s. Wow. And then here we've got these two, are these, what are these two? Uh, Boston rotary valve cornets. Uh-huh. Boston and the McFadden. Uh -huh. And then we've got this guy. And, the letter, pocket and this thing with the crazy. That's an echo cornet. Um, Adelbert Greedle, Chicago. And the Con 4 and 1. Wow. And down here. The graves over the shoulder cornet. With <laughs> Civil War guy. Uh huh. Pre Civil War. Pre Civil War. Here is the key bugle, yeah? Yeah, that's the graves. Uh -huh. And the one in the corner is the graves uh, post, post horn. It's just a tiny trumpet from the 1840s. Amazing. Down on this shelf. It's a McFadden English cornopian. And here? It's a Richardson C, uh, at the fourth ascending valve, C and D. And this guy. Graves C cornet. Wow. And then down here. That's a very unusual sax horn that was sold here in New Orleans. Pro it? Probably 1840s. Oh, wow. And a German G trumpet. Mm-hmm. A Swedish cornet. Yeah. Or Prussian cornet. And a Boston F trumpet. Bach uh, B flat trumpet from the 20s. Uh-huh. And then this. Fisk E flat tuba, 1850s. Uh-huh. And there's the Alpha Clyde. Alpha Clyde. Wow. Made in Paris. Don't you you've you've made Alpha Clydes too? Yeah, yeah, I made a few. Uh-huh. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everything in that case is um conical. <laughs> More or less. So there, there is the supremacy yeah. writ large. There's one, two lonely cylindrical instruments down at the bottom. <laughs> Everything else, <laughs> they've seen the light. Well, read my article on the difference between trumpets and cornets, too, though. We will post a link to that because I'm fascinated with that. There's your closet of cases. Are those horns in there or just cases? Mostly with horns. Oh, my. Now, how do you decide what gets to stay and what doesn't? I try to gauge how tolerant my wife is. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you mean the whole house would be full of horns? If oh, you... possibly. And of course you have, this is a, a wax cylinder? Yeah, Edison 
cylinder phonograph. <sighs> How old is it? Uh, about 1910, I think. 1910. Nothing rare or anything. Oh, looks rare to me. This is amazing. So, if you had to predict what instruments that are being made now will we be looking at in 150 to 200 years? <laughs> Any of them? That's hard to know. You know, the, the interest in history had a big surge in the, around 1890s, and, I mean, 1990s and so. <laughs> and uh, then it seems like the younger generation has less inter interest in history. So I don't know if that's going to go away completely. But it seems like everything's being documented better now. So, you know, that we'll probably have at least a couple of tubas played by Doug Tornquist in some collection. Oh, <laughs> you're so funny. Uh, yeah, I've already made arrangements with the Smithsonian, of course. And it, <laughs> just kidding. I, I know you said this years ago, but I don't know if it's true anymore. Has eBay changed the business at all? Completely, yeah. Really? <laughs> I mean, the internet in general, mm -hmm. eBay specifically during the late 1890s and early 2000s, it, mm -hmm. it was a drastic change. In fact, uh, almost every day, day someone would come in the shop and want to talk about eBay, and I would say, you can't judge anything by eBay. But the funny thing is, now that all the dust is settled, people want me to appraise a horn, I usually just say, no, go on eBay and see what they're going for. Mm, <laughs> you know, I haven't done that, so you've got to do it yourself. Okay, I get it. Well, we really want to thank you for showing us your workshop and your museum and your office. It's just been a real treat, and you are a Southern California treasure. <laughs> and uh, anyway, thanks for, for spending some time with us today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See you, Rob. It, what an absolutely awesome thing to see, uh, I think. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful instruments. And, Doug, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do that. Right now, um, we have a really special surprise for everybody out there. Um, my my co-host, um, I can't say enough great things about him as a person, but also he's probably one of my favorite tuba players out there. And he's really, really one of the finest soloists around as well. And one thing I, I really love about Doug is he's trying to push our literature forward. And he's going to premiere a piece for you right now that he had commissioned. Uh, the composer's name is Peter Yard Martin. And um, he's, ne I'll get into that for next week too, but um, here's Doug Tornquist playing Arc Lines. Thank you. 
For those of you out there who thought that that was simple, no, it is not. <laughs> and in fact, I wanted to ask you about this because it was uh, it was something that um, you told me the other day when you, you played this for me, and I was going, yeah, man, this sounds great. I mean, but Doug actually created a click track uh-huh. to practice this by because for those of you who didn't get to see the music, uh, the time signature pretty much changes every bar, right? Or well, every two bars? It, it changes every bar. Five eight two four three eight seven eight. He even wrote in some time signatures that don't exist, like uh, four six. Four six. Okay. Yes, or yeah. Two six. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, I didn't. So, qu- so deciphering that from a time aspect, because you know it's got to go on. I mean, what was your thought process to get through that? Well, I thought I would first learn what he wrote, so I created a click track. He, the tempo was marked eighth note equals one ninety two. So I thought, well, okay, I'll learn it and. I mean, from a performer's perspective, the learner's perspective, it's just a series of my major triads. Each chord is a major triad in a different, a different plane, if you will, a different tonality. And then the piece is connected by different sets of threes, quarter note triplets, um, eighth note triplets, and then um, eighth note triplets over two eighth notes within a 5-8 bar. And uh, Peter, the composer, is in London, so he was talking about quavers and crotchets and semi-quavers and... Anyway, you know, <laughs> what is that? Two, 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 two which, countries. Which us Americans don't really yeah. get. <laughs> two countries separated by a, a common language. Is yeah. that, is that the, so, <laughs> awesome. So, well said, sir. <laughs> so I, I learned the piece with a click track, and then I played it for Peter. And it's like, well, he's so polite, you know. I mean, he said, it's not very laid back. Oh, okay, fine. So I threw the click track away, and then... Um, I actually had to take some time off for the, from the piece. A few other things happened this month. And I came back to it, and I thought, this piece is so far from playing. And John was like, well, you should play it anyway. So John I, convinced I, I thought, hey, I thought you stuck it. And it, you actually, when, when I was at your house on Tuesday, and, and I made you play it for me, I, uh, I thought you were, it was fine then. But this was, this was a very, very nice performance, man. It's, we're we're going to do it again. That was the first premiere. He's also written a brass quintet, which we're, we're going to try to do in two weeks. And then we're going to have Peter on as a guest, and he's going to talk about the, the connections between the two pieces. Yeah, his, his music is really, really cool, and, and I'm, I'm really kind of looking forward to that. He, he does a lot of uh, offset and syncopated rhythms. I, I got to know him because of this piece he wrote for tuba and brass band called The Fabulous Gecko which we played a rehearsal yeah, of right. long ago. Yeah, and for those of you out there, you should go check that out because uh, everybody's always looking for new stuff to play. And I'll tell you what, this is good music right here. And speaking of good music, um, maybe we should have the guys come back up. Please do. A little bit more. Let's get this spare tube out of yeah, the way. Yeah. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask the guys to come back up if if they don't mind. And uh, the next tune we're going to play is, is one that... Um, was one of the first tunes I ever learned in this style. And, um, well, how shall I put it? It was kind of Pops' one of his signature tunes, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, and it, thank you, Joey. And, and Pops' wife actually wrote this tune. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, Here's a little strutting with some barbecue.
everybody enjoyed that i know we had a really great time up here um and it, it's really great playing with a bunch of guys who who come on who actually know the style and we're able to sit there and do stop times and trade fours and do eights and and just kind of like change things up on the fly key changes because uh we've all been doing this for so long it's just it's just a lot of fun man and that that's what i love about dixieland is it's just it's kind of a free-for-all well you guys are just giants it's incredible to hear you play hey man do you mind uh talking to joey and chris over there a little bit you want to it's more if they'll talk to me okay. <laughs> <laughs> now i just start with this trombone player and i met you in the summer of dare i say it 1983 remember yeah i very much remember that that was great that was the only year that they had two all-american college bands at a park and and you were in the one that we were in different bands but we were still hanging a lot yeah i was at epcot center and you were with them and you were at the magic kingdom yeah and uh, they were both sort of miserable in their own way. <laughs> Why? Well, it was hot. And <laughs> the food was cheap. Uh, <laughs> what else can we say? You know, it was, it was a great experience, and it really changed my life. No, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're in Florida in the summertime, so, you know, there's bugs the size of a Volkswagen, and it's pretty hot. But musically, uh, I mean, there's... Uh, very dear friends from that band that I'm actually going on a camping trip with tomorrow in Denver. So oh. still Nat Wickham and Trog, oh, and uh, Bob Kruger from our band. Yeah, and Greg Boyer from your band. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I still see Phil Keen from my band. Yeah, I work next to him all the time. So you, since then, you have gone on to be, I was reading your bio, okay, performer, educator, arranger, composer. Uh, you kind of done it all. Orchestrator. Okay. Because I followed your career for a little bit as a, as a trombonist, and then I see your name as a composer. Can you talk a little bit about all the things you've done? Well, you can sum it up with one word, which is just keep trying and trying to find something different. Lately, as a player, I've been doing a lot of stuff with balloons. I went through my balloon period, and then I got away from it when my kids were younger. Now my kids are growing up, and I'm going back to the balloons. So. But I always like to think of it like Picasso had his blue period. 
he only had one blue period. So I'm trying to up Picasso by having two balloon periods. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. right. Right. So, yeah. but as a composer, it's funny because uh, I think most people think of me. I, I don't feel like I'm a really great trombone player. You know, there's so many great trombone players. I just had my mute bag stolen. And uh, so I went up to Andy's house because he offered to get me some mutes. That's actually his bag over there with the San Francisco Giants thing on it. Of it is. Not only did he give me the mutes, he gave me the damn bag, you know. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, and Charlie gave me some mutes and Ben Dev gave me some mutes. So everyone came to bat for me. But my point was, I don't feel like I'm in a league as a trombone player. But as a musician, I feel like I can hang on the trombone. As a composer, I'm a little more snarky. <laughs> well, I, I know you. I, I know your piece for tuba and clarinet, and um, it is it's it's a great piece. And I remember that summer you also played piano in the jazz band, right? I think that's how I got the gig because they called me pretty late for that gig. You know, I mean, I swore in the audition. You're not supposed to do that at a Disney audition. You know, like I I missed the high D flat, which I usually do on Little Brown Jug. You know, and I said, you know, what I said, mm -hmm. and there was kind of this stunned silence and. I didn't get called for that gig till late, later in the summer, so I think someone bailed, and then they realized, oh, this Yutz can play the piano too, so they needed that for the jazz sets. So that was when you stopped swearing and you never used another uh, word like that. Yeah, well, as we know, <laughs> Disney has a profound influence. <laughs> hey, Doug. Hey, Doug. As long as you're interviewing Joey, who I have a monumental amount of respect for, ask him how he earned the nickname Knuckles. <laughs> we can talk about that, uh, but not in public. <laughs> Okay, please put that in the chat. All questions will be answered. <laughs> Send a self-addressed stamped envelope. <laughs> well, that is amazing. Now, you're also working at Saddleback College, right, and teaching. Right, so when we, we af after Disneyland, where I worked for a little over 10 years, my wife and I moved to New York, and that was a really important part of my development because I just got totally... I mean, I was just totally inspired by those players there. And then I got offered a teaching position at Northern Illinois University. And so we went there for three years after our daughter was born. So thought it might be nice to have a steady income. And, um, and then got called to come back to Settleback College in 2002. And it's been really, I feel, uh, a lot of gratitude for the experience there because it was such a shock for me coming into that from what my previous life had been. And I was very welcome there. And I feel really really a great sense of gratitude to have that as an employer where we can be engaged in create creative activity at all counts. Well, I'm sure they're delighted to have you there, and it's great to hear you play. I am just, as a classical player, I'm always amazed at how each of you finds your role and your like stratum within the group, and it sounds like it was um, planned that way, and it's, it's all uh, just random, right? Well, one of the most beautiful things about New Orleans-style jazz is this concept of polyphony. Obviously, jazz before polyphony, I mean, the greatest polyphonic composer, probably Bach. But we have different roles that we all understand and know what, what our role is. And when everyone just knows that, there's a lot of creative latitude within that freedom, like with most improvised jazz, I imagine. But you're playing a style. I mean, I wouldn't play this way if I were playing my balloon music, but I'm going to try to play... Just like, you know, you might phrase differently in a Baroque piece as opposed to a class, modern classical piece. I like that, though. You, if you know your place, that's where the creativity lies. A lot of freedom. Always a lot of freedom in, in any kind of music, no matter what the style. Amazing. Well, thank you, Joe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk with Chris. Actually, uh, let, oh. me, let me come over here first, if you don't mind. So um, for those of you out here, there, uh, the, f the four of us actually playing the Jambalaya Jazz Band, and... These two guys, um, I've been fortunate enough <laughs> uh, to uh, actually have known since college. And uh, at that time, these two guys started a band called the Side Street Strutters. And um, Joey and I both were in that band for, let's see, Joey was what, 15? 15 years in the band? Yeah, and mine was like about 23, and you guys are still going strong, still still booking gigs out there. But the other thing, too, is I've worked with these guys at the park now for 36 years. I mean, it's 36 years, and, and it's pretty amazing. Um, we were talking earlier about this legacy thing, and I, and I thought maybe you guys could chime in on that a little bit about that the park having, or Disneyland, for those of you who don't my my thing here but um and talk a little bit about maybe the importance that you've because uh, obviously i think we're all on the same page with this thing um and what you feel about you know dixieland and and traditional jazz being at the park vince you got anything to weigh in on yeah i i um 
I'm probably the only one out of this entourage today that did not pursue music at a younger age. I, I actually stopped playing this instrument for almost 10 years before meeting you guys through Rob and the influence that you, Joey Sellers, and, and, and some of the other guys that are not here today had on me have been literally life-changing, uh, in particular Joey Sellers. Uh, listening to him, hearing his philosophy on music, how I should approach my role in this art form was literally life-changing for me, and, and um, I will be forever in debt for that experience. I've loved my experience at Disneyland. Uh, I miss playing with you and Tom and some of the other guys out there in the Jambalaya Jazz Band. So uh, I welcome the opportunity to come back and I, I welcome the opportunity or, or, or thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to experience this kind of life, which has been amazing to me. Yeah, well, I'll tell you right now, Vince, um, it still shocks me that you, you got some of the best years in the business. You really do. No, seriously. You know, we throw curveballs at you all the time and you're just like, okay. And, uh, and most guys would be pissed about that. But, <laughs> but, but hang, on, hang on a second. But um, Rob actually is the front guy for the, uh, the Side Street Strutters. And um, if you haven't checked them out, please go to their website, check out their stuff and everything. And Rob does a bunch of other stuff too. But um, go ahead, Rob. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to kind of plug you a little bit. Oh, thank you for that. But no, you, you and Doug talked earlier. You reminded the, the viewers of the, the rich history of Dixieland jazz at Disneyland and how Walt really em embraced that music Louis Armstrong on you know there and and all the big bands that came through what we knew as Carnation Garden stage you know on a we any given about, week you know we could hear you know, Buddy Bay Rich or Basie's band and all that and Lionel Hampton all those groups that's where, that's where we met oh we okay when he was on with Hampton. Jimmy there you go so I, I, I think what, what is really neat is, at least up to this point, Disney has recognized that tradition and has always had New Orleans-style jazz bands in the park. Of course, the Royal Street Bachelors, a very historic group, and, um, and Side Street Strutters were proud to be part of that history for 22 years. And I'm just hoping that they recognize that and, and, and bring that back. Because the whole idea with all these atmosphere groups, as they call it at Disney, is to bring the area to life. So when somebody's walking through New Orleans Square, yeah, they see the buildings, the, the wrought iron, the architecture, they can have a fritter and experience the cuisine of New Orleans, but nothing brings it to that extra step than a jazz band out there throwing Mardi Gras beads and playing some of the traditional tunes. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because it just reminded me, uh, a friend of mine posted the other day, he said he was at the park and uh, he was listening to the BGM and there was nothing else going on. And he, he said, man, really miss you guys being there. And we really miss being there as well. So, uh, <laughs> no, no, hang on, hang on. I want to I talk to Tommy for just a second. Yes, come on, come on, Tommy. You know, you don't want to? Okay, good. So, um, Tom, Tom Liston is probably the, uh, the, one of the most versatile musicians I've ever met in my life. Um, not only does he play wonderful banjo, but also wonderful guitar. He plays trombone, he plays sousaphone and tuba, and this summer you're doing your steel drum gig, right? And he's got this really great steel drum band and everything, and for those of you out there who are always going, well, where can I find work, where can I find work? Well, this guy not only finds work, but he invents work. And, <laughs> and being at Disneyland, I mean, I mean, before we were out, you were working six, seven days a week, right? I mean, I mean, it just as much as you wanted to, for the most part, right? Yeah, here and there. Yeah, just doing different things. I always, that's what's always kept me going. It's just like doing a variety of different styles and playing with different people. You know, just it's great. Yeah, I just really spice of life, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not to, not to mention then you never get tired of the repertoire either, because you're because you're, you're playing all kinds of different stuff all the time. Yeah, it's, yeah, it really keeps the creative thing going. It's really. That's what, what I really enjoy the most. You know, and, and I, I think Doug and I have talked about this a lot, and that's kind of what I preach a lot on the show is go out there and try different stuff. Try playing different stuff. You don't have to play Blazovich all the time. You don't have to do this all the time. You don't have to do all this other kind of crap all the time. Go out and try it out, man. It's all really good. So I'm going to toss it back to Doug, and maybe he can talk to Chris a little bit. But we're not talking to you. No, I talked to you the other week. Yeah, so we're done. So, Chris, where, where was it that we met? I... 
I'm guessing it was Disneyland. Wasn't it in the in the Dickens band? <laughs> no. 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 No, it was February of 1993. We're we're on a plane eastbound for oh, okay. Tokyo. You're right. Okay. No, no, I remember you in the in the in the contract reading. That's right. Yeah. All right. I remember you Did you ask about the lumbar support was that was that one of yours? No, I think I was asking about the shade shade stipulations. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had a very specific contract, and uh, I remember going to the meeting now. Yeah. So, and then we actually we actually shared the same address for a while, didn't we? Yes, uh, the Biblos. The Biblo, not just the the seventh floor. Seventh floor, of the Biblos Hotel. Well, uh, what was your room number? You know, I went twice, so mm. I can't recall. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I went back as as the contractor, and I and I set things up in 2004. So they put me in a nicer a nicer hotel. Then. Oh, that's why you went for the hotel. Yeah, it was really nice. It was about 40 square feet, so you know it had a TV, and then that was pretty much it. Oh, you had a TV. Yeah, we had a TV, and <laughs> you know all the uh, uh, inappropriate uh, Japanese television you could possibly want to see. <laughs> Absolutely. No. Chris, Chris and I worked a job in uh, House Tembus, which was um, uh, not a theme park, but a cultural resort. Right. It, it was, uh, uh, they had tried it earlier in um, uh, Nagasaki, and they had built a small prototype, which was, I don't know how big, but it was big. It was a, it was a park. And then they thought, well, this was great, so let's build the biggest thing we've ever seen anywhere and, and put every Dutch building that they could get uh, blueprints to, and we'll build all of them. And then, sure, people will come, won't they? Well, they did, but we had swans and we had tulips. I remember we had that museum full of fake Dutch masters. The, the idea was it's only a matter of time before we get the real ones. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and the thing is, the park went out of business, I think it's on the 5th, the fifth time they've gone out of business and this, uh -huh, the city uh -huh. just took it over yeah. these gigantic buildings and they are built to exact specifications to what they are in Holland, right. but they serve no purpose. Did, yep. did you see that Miyazaki film spirited away? I did not. Well, did you, did you play it, on that? One of my no, I did not. But, but, <laughs> but, but it begins with this, this little girl and she goes into this deserted theme park and she says, wow, look at this place. These were really big in the nineties. <laughs> yeah. Well, there it is. So, <laughs> And I got to play with Doug, and I won't discuss the costume that Doug had to wear because I don't think it would be fair. Well, you wore a sailor outfit, so you got off easy. Yes, I did not wear what you wore. I would like to hear Doug's outfit. Me too. Okay, just for posterity, I don't have a picture, but I'll find one. We'll start with the shoes. I have shoes, flesh-colored tights, yes. pink knickers. None of this is important. I had a, a, I remember it was a peasant blouse with big floppy <laughs> sleeves with pink piping. Let's get to the real thing. I had a, a pink and black plaid nope. vest. Nope. I had a blue Tire. apron no. with <laughs> the pockets. The pockets were baloney. Remember, they were functional baloney pockets on yes. a, my blue satin yes. apron. Yes. But I wore for every day, six months, <clears throat> I wore a crown of weenies. The wiener hat. Yes. <laughs> it, was, it was wieners put together mm -hmm. it, it, vertically mm -hmm. all around what to make a hat. He was a butcher. Oh, come on. Oh, I thought I was the sausage man. Well, you were a sausage man, according to the Japanese, but I, I went ahead and called it butcher because that made more sense. Man, it's a little more poetic. <laughs> but they did. They called him sausage man. They did. Well, I don't know what That's they called what me. We called you. I know, probably not. And probably not what the Japanese called me either. But, but we got some good playing. I mean, yeah. we got to play plink, plank, plunk every day. Well, and we played Gabrielli. Oh, we did play Gabrielli. And we played. We had those huge audiences, too, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we played Shite, we played uh, Gabrielli, we played, uh, uh -huh. I forget who else. Yeah, it was ridiculous. It was, yes, but, you know, we got in a lot of good playing. Yeah. I, I practiced a lot, I, and that's where I got to know you, you know. That's right, and, and we, we did that for s nine months, I think. Well, I broke the, I had six, six yes, but, and, uh, yeah, we rode the train together. Yep. Yeah. We didn't see a lot of you. You, uh, ah. you went off on your own after a while when... When the sausage hat had done its job. It's, that I, sounds like Doug. I, I discovered I discovered the Dairy Queen at that, that stop right before, and in high key, remember? Yes, I do. 
<laughs> anyway, but I now it's my turn to embarrass you. But Chris is one of the most incredible lead trumpet players I know. He's the style king. He can do anything. Uh, the only person I knew who sounded like you is Warren Looning, and he was an encyclopedia of style, which I think you are. And um, you are tearing it up here in Los Angeles. You're the first choice for lead trumpet on so many orchestral jobs. You sound incredible well, thank in you. this group. And because, um, you know, I'm going to ask you to play a free gig, so that's why I'm yeah, saying this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's the only kind of gigs I get, so this works out great. Uh, I, I like to play, I like these other guys, as much different things as I can. And so I, I put my toe into a little bit of classical music. Uh, I, I play as much quintet things as I can, and then I... I can play some lead and I can play some jazz and you know I, I would say more a jack of all trades because that's kind of what I need to do to make a living you know and can you answer a question for me is the trumpet appropriate for this style the cornet was not used historically no both uh, uh, cornet was certainly used um, it, it, it became an issue of how it was being recorded uh, you know they recorded into these giant cones right mm -hmm. And so it depended on, on uh, how much volume they needed. Mm -hmm. And the, the, tr the cornet was really the solo instrument, just like it was in, in, in classical music. It, it bridged that gap. And so a soloist wanted to play cornet, but the trumpet was louder. It was mm -hmm. easier, it was easier to, to get out there. And so I think that the natural transition came. Um, but you saw, you know, Big Spiderback played mm -hmm. a lot of cornets. Sure. Uh, uh, Louis did play cornet early in his career, and then he went to trumpet. Um, so I, I think that it was out there. All right. Yeah, I didn't bring one because mine plays really out of tune. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's me or the cornet, but somebody mm -hmm. involved with the cornet is out mm -hmm. of tune. Yeah, well, a workman never blames his tools. But <laughs> uh, Journey does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you guys play. Chris has been a great player. Uh, um, come on up here because we're kind of running out of time. Are you going to play some more? Yeah, we're going to do one more tune, but... Um, I wanted to first of all thank everybody out there for tuning in today. We are having an ultimate gas here, and the band's going to play one more tune. And I'd also like to thank all my friends up here on stage for taking a little time out on their Sunday. And just wonderful playing as always. Thanks for having me. Just really great. Um, next week on our show, is it next week we're going to do the quintet show? It just might be. Yeah, so next week, uh, tune in again. We're going to be back here at Local 7 for a live brass quintet show. And... Uh, I don't think I'm going to play, which is really great because that's like the first time in a long time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of down with that. Okay. And it's all going to be on Doug. Okay. So, um, but thanks for a great show today, man. Thank you, John. And um, we're going to play one more tune. Here's a little George Gershwin tune to take you guys out. Please join us again next Sunday for Conical Supremacy at 3 p.m. You can find us on Facebook, Twitch, and or YouTube. And uh, I want to thank my co-host and good friend Doug Tornquist for his time and effort today and all of you guys as well. Thank you so much. You made my day today. So here's a little George Gershwin tune called It's Wonderful.